Good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, on behalf of AIG Hospital, uh, the acad academic department uh, head, Mr. Satanayana, and uh, IT department, Mr. Mohan and his team, Mr. Robin, uh, and our uh, director of surgical gastro, Dr. G. V. Rao, for giving us uh, this auditorium for today's uh, webinar. It's my privilege uh, to be here. And indeed, it's a great privilege to have the leading experts in TIVA. They are internationally renowned experts in TIVA with us today uh, to interact. Uh, Dr. Karunakaran Ramaswamy is the attending uh, physician uh, at Sidra School of Medicine, Doha, Qatar, as a consultant anesthesiologist. I'm glad that uh, he, he just uh, salvaged the uh, unanticipated major optic hemorrhage and is with us here. Thanks, uh, Dr. KK, for joining us today. Uh, Thank Dr. you so much for the invite. Uh, Thank Dr. you. Dr. Tusar Chokshi is uh, from Vadodara. He heads the Department of Anesthesia at Baroda Kidney Institute and Lithotripsy Center. And uh, whenever you have uh, TIVA, it is uh, Dr. Dr. Tushar's name is uh, automatically associated. All three of them have conducted several, several workshops. No TIVA workshop in India goes without Subramaniam and without Tushar uh, on board. Uh, tremendous uh, experience uh, in the field of uh, TIVA and he is the founder, director and founder of TIVA Society of India. Welcome Dr. Uh, Tushar Jokshi. Thank you sir. Uh, Dr. Subhinam Mahakali, we had, uh, had a fond privilege of having him in the regional the workshop a couple of months back and here he is again with us. Uh, uh, he is the lead consultant at Astor RV Hospital, Bangalore and his uh, uh, areas of interest are ultrasound in anesthesia and ultrasound in critical care and he is probably an expert or renowned expert in all gastric ultrasound. Uh, welcome Dr. Uh, Subramaniam Mahakali with us. So they will be sharing uh, with us and they will be involved in the uh, panel discussion towards the end but before that we have uh, two talks and let me introduce my uh, clinical head Dr. Lakshmi Yalavarti. Uh, she leads the Department of Anesthesia, Perioperative Medicine and Critical Care at uh, EIG Hospital. Uh, she is a cardiac anesthetist by uh, subspecialty and she is a certified uh, echocardiographer from the Cleveland Clinic and she did cardiac anesthesia fellowship uh, as well as anesthesia uh, from uh, uh, US uh, from Cleveland Clinic uh, and a very, very experienced and practical uh, uh, clinician I would say. Uh, with a human touch. Welcome Dr. Lakshmi. Thank you. And uh, I hand over the proceedings to Dr. Lakshmi to take it further. Thank you. And uh, we welcome you all for the webinar on total intravenous anesthesia, which we fondly, fondly say TIVA technique. So total intravenous anesthesia is nothing but uh, maintenance of general anesthesia by intravenous infusions. But the most, by far, even until today, the commonest and the preferred technique that everyone would like to say is the inhalation anesthesia for maintenance of general anesthesia. But there are scenarios where we feel like uh, the inhalation anesthesia, I mean, the, is not possible or it's contraindicated. Like scenarios where you want to uh, maintain general anesthesia, you want to give a uh, general anesthesia outside the operating room or during patient transfer. So in the or any of the processes that involves airway. So in those scenarios, the inhalation anesthesia is not uh, possible. And in some scenarios, like when a patient has a history of malignant hypothermia or when Neuro procedures like craniotomies where they would like to involve the motor or sensory evoked potentials where inhalation anesthesia will interfere with it. Or when patients come up with a uh, very severe history of post-op nausea and vomiting and just like, uh, you know, in those scenarios where the inhalation anesthesia is contraindicated. So that's where the TIVA technique comes into action. Even though on an everyday basis, we try to use the balance technique, both inhalational and uh, intravenous anesthesia uh, for the safety of the patient and for a balanced approach. But uh, in these scenarios where we felt like the TIVA anesthesia helps us a lot. So that's how the idea of webinar came into the picture with the recent modern technology of target controlled uh, infusion pumps and with the closed loop and also with the ability to identify um, the tissue concentrations with the, of the drug medication. So with this kind of recent developments, we thought this is an appropriate time. Uh, 
uh, for uh, having a webinar on total intravenous anesthesia. And we are, as Dr. Sunil mentioned, we are truly privileged and honored to have these three stalwarts with us to share their experiences with us. So before we go ahead, um, I would like to introduce our guest speakers, to, uh, our anesthesia colleagues, our speakers for the uh, day, uh, Dr. Neha and Dr. Trupti. And I would proudly say that just like how we do balanced approach in our day-to-day -day life for uh, anesthesia, they both balance personal and professional uh, you know, commitments in a very balanced way. I mean, I won't be wrong to say my entire department will agree with it that the, the parties that we have, the get-togethers that we have, won't be have, uh, that joyful without these two uh, so very proud to have them in our department. So we'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Neha. So Dr. Na Dr. Neha Magood, she has done her MD anesthesia from LTMMC, Mumbai, followed by her fellowship in neurocritical care from Medanta. She has been working as our consultant anesthesia at AIG Hospitals Gachibauli since for the last two years and her special interest is mainly in the critical care. So today she is going to have us go through the evolution of total intravenous anesthesia techniques, how we moved uh, right from the beginning from inhalational to the importance of uh, in, uh, intravenous anesthesia today because when the concept was there for a long time, but it was mainly either with a manual, like with a single syringe, or with the uh, infusion pumps, with a single infusion pumps, to the level of target control infusions, to a level of where we can actually deliver it to a specific tissue concentration. So she's going to take us from the evolution and also the must-know pharmacology part of it, so that we can deliver a safe, uh, TIVA technique to the patients. So over to you, Dr. Neha, on the evolution and must-know pharmacology of TIVA. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the kind words, ma'am. I'm going to talk today about total intravenous anesthesia, the evolution and pharmacology must know. The evolution of TIVA started around 350 years ago when Renan Major injected a dog with opium dissolved in water. The dog was pleasantly stupefied, but it did not kill it. Although there were no more studies during that era, in 1845, Francis Rind developed hollow needle. In 1853, Charles Gabriel Pravan developed syringe. In 1872, Cyprian Ore used mm -hmm. chloral hydrate for IV use. In 1909, Hedonal was used to give general anesthesia, which was a urethrin de derivative which was earlier used to, uh, uh, for patients with insomnia. Subsequently led to development of paraldehyde, magnesium sulfate and ethanol with limited success. In 1921, somnifen, first barbiturate, was used for IV anesthesia. In 1934, Lundy and Water started clinical trials on thiopentone, which were given up in view of incidents at Pearl Harbor, where a lot of uh, deaths were responsible, were attributed to thiopentone. Further studies were again restarted during World War II. In 1964, etomidate was discovered in Belgium. Propanidid, a first non-barbiturate IV anesthetic, was introduced in 1965. It was withdrawn due to anaphylactic reactions. In early 1970s, propofol synthesized by Glenn and colleagues. Propofol lipid emulsion was available in 1983 and FDA approved in 1989. The concept of balanced anesthesia involving regional anesthesia, general anesthesia along with pre-medication was introduced by John Lundy in 1926. Ketamine was developed in 1962, Ramifentanil in 1996, Dexmed in 1999, and the recent one is Ciprofol in 2020. What is the definition of TIVA, total intravenous anesthesia? It is a technique of general anesthesia which uses combination drugs exclusively given by intravenous route, does not involve any use of inhalation, 
It's used in the form of IV drips, boluses and infusion pumps. It includes both induction and maintenance. So why Tiva when we have inhalation agents? Uh, due to lack of uh, development in inhalation agents in the last few decades and we have a much better modality to produce Tiva in our, uh, to give Tiva in our patients, we have again moved back to total IV anesthesia. It is much more comfortable than inhalational induction for patients with no mask on their face. There is no smell of any volatile agents. There is less pollution. It is much uh, better for a greenhouse uh, effect. Avoids distension of air filled spaces. There is no risk of malignant hyperthermia. It, uh, dexmeritomidine agents like dexmeritomidine produce a much natural sleep. There is less emergence phenomena compared to sevoflurane, desflurane. Better cerebral autoregulation, preservation, uh, so it's preferred uh, in neurosurgeries and neuromonitoring. Less chances of post-op nausea, vomiting. Anesthesia, non-operative and remote locations where the bulky uh, vaporizers are too, uh, too difficult to carry. In anticipated intubation, non-muscular blocking agent based day, day care and short procedure. It is also easy to titrate in old age patients, although a preferred technique is using bis-guided uh, titration and uh, going for a lower minimum target concentration using the recent target uh, concentration pumps that. The disadvantages of TIVA include pain on injection, although that can be made pain-free by use of Loxicard, Keta and other drugs, a uh, need for IV prior to induction. So this is one difficulty that we face mostly in pediatric population. Although pediatric TIVA, the WFSA guidelines suggest that we can go for pediatric TIVA after volatile induction in case of a failed uh, IV access. It is irreversible once injected because of uh, lack of a uh, MAC uh, a concentration uh, cannot be measured. So we have to be cautious in obese patients in geriatric population and patients with low cardiac output. Cautious and prolonged procedure as it has cumulative effect. Need for suitable drug delivery systems. Disposables contribute to plastic waste. Risk of bacterial contamination because of which the propofol has to be uh, discarded uh, after opening uh, maximum after 6 hours. Difficult to know blood concentration and increased risk of awareness when using. Let's understand something about pharmacokinetics and TIVA. Three different types of pharmacokinetic models, compartment models, physiological and hybrid models. The earlier developed uh, compartment models comprised of single compartment model, which uh, used drug being delivered to a single compartment and studying its elimination from that compartment. Further development led to the three compartment model, which comprises of three compartments, namely V1, V2 and V3. V1 signifies the highly perfused organs, including plasma, uh, and uh, organs that are, that are highly profuse, that is brain, spinal cord, kidney and liver, where more than 75% of the cardiac output. And uh, luckily for us, the effect site is a brain and spinal cord, where majority of the drug is taken up. Then comes the V2 compartment, which are the slowly equi equilibrating compartment, uh, including muscle and skin. And the slowest compartment, the uh, slowest perfused organs like fat and comprise V3. The constants that are indicated by K12, K21 are the equilibration constant. When the drug concentration slowly, firstly the drug fills the V1 compartment uh, comprising mainly of plasma and that moves down the concentration gradient into v V2 compartment and V3 compartment is the last to get filled. When all these three compartments get filled uh, that is called as a steady state concentration that are indicated by the velocity constant or the equilibration constant that is K12. K12 indicates the movement of the drug from V1 to V2 and once it is equi equilibrated and back uh, from V2 to V1, elimination is indicated by K21. So this model does not represent real anatomical entities. It quantifies drug movements mathematically. Drug is distributed to different tissues within body at different rates. Uh, the declining concentration is by elimination and distribution. 
Rate constants describe the rate of movement by the drug between central compartment and each of other compartments and also the rate of elimination from the central compartment. The limitation of this model is that there is inter-individual pharmacokinetic variability between a patient weighing 40 kg and 100 kg, you cannot use the same model. Again, variability based on age, based on cardiac output. The SDO mixing of drugs in compartment doesn't describe uptake by lung or GI tract. It is a very static. In practice, IV drug doesn't equilibrate instantaneously. Other aspects of dynamic state. The physiological models describe drug uptake in different tissues and influence recirculation of the patient. But it requires a set of mostly unknown parameters. For instance, we need to know. Uh, the distribution in every tissue, a steady state, a time based concentration at every second in every tissue, which is not possible to know uh, with the physiological models, to, to develop the physiological models. Hybrid models are compartment models adjusted to physiological parameters such as cardiac output. Using pharmacokinetic compartment modeling, computer programs can simulate profiles of drug distribution and elimination. Different pharmacokinetic profiles can grossly affect the drug suitability for use by TIVA. So what is context-sensitive half-time? It indicates the time to wake up. The time in which plasma concentration of the drug reduces by 50% after discontinuation of an infusion. It is a net result of elimination and clearance from plasma into a non-equilibrated tissue. Short context sensitive half time is desirable if a drug is to be used for TIVA as it would infer quick recovery. It does not necessarily correlate with reduction plasma concentration by 50%. So in, in patients who are obese or who have low cardiac output, you cannot predict that the patient would wake up once the uh, concentration comes down after a particular time because in those patients, uh, due to a larger V3 compartment, they may have a delayed recovery. So a context sensitive half time is not always a good predictor of a recovery of the patient. So this graph shows us the different con uh, context sensitive half, half lives of different drugs. As we can see, if we stop the infusion of propofol after four hours, the context sensitive half time is around 20 minutes. Similarly, if you continue it for 8 hours, it goes up by 40 minutes. So that means the, the propofol is going into the V3 compartment and the slowing, it's slower to come out. So it takes a longer time for, it to, for the patient to recover. Whereas in case of ramifentanil, since you stop the infusion at 2 hours or at 8 hours, the concentration or the time to, for the patient to wake up, that's the context sensitive half time, stays almost the same. So the inference that we get from this is that ramifentanil is independent of infusion duration. What is effect side equilibrium? It is a lag time between achieving a specific plasma concentration and observing a particular clinical response. Time to equilib equilibrate with the effect side is different for different drugs. Depends on physical properties of drug and receptor binding properties. The effect side decrement time is used to predict recovery. Mathematical or temporal relationship between the concentration of plasma and response is observed. It is a time taken to equilibrate is described by rate constant, KEO. So KEO basically tells us when the plasma concentration goes down and the uh, effect side concentration uh, is at the equilibrium with the plasma concentration. The higher we get a KEO value for a particular drug, the better the uh, drug uh, effect site concentration is the faster we get the response. KEO is a liaison between pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic phase of the drug. But for estimation of KEO, we need a static plasma concentration. That is, we are assuming that the uh, plasma concentration is not declining any further. It is not flowing to any other compartment. This uh, uh, table describes the uh, 
constant for and t half ko for some of the drugs as we can see for morphine has a lowest ko that means it's t half that is the effect side concentration after giving morphine uh, is achieved in 17 minutes that is the time it takes for the concentration to reach 50 percent of the plasma concentration whereas in propofol the keo is 0.25 that the time it takes to reach uh, the effect side concentration to reach 50 percent is around 2.7 minutes so the shorter the keo the longer uh, the time it takes to uh, achieve a effect side concentration high keo means a rapid onset what is the clinical application of this model a bolus dose calculated to fill the central compartment is required a constant rate infusion to replace a lug drug lost by elimination and an exponentially decreasing infusion that will replace drug lost from the plasma by transfer or distribution to peripheral tissues so we need a bolus dose to fill the central compartment and then a constant rate infusion to replace the drug that is lost based on this we have manually controlled infusions we have uh, other target control infusions which will be discussed in detail by dr tripti a brief idea about manual control infusion is uh, i'll be giving you an idea about the bristol infusion regimen which is used for propofol which is based on lean body weight where a plasma concentration of 3.5 mics per ml uh, for adequate for body surface surgery is required to achieve that plasma concentration, the patient is pre-medicated with 3 mics per kg of fentanyl followed by induction with 1 mg per kg bolus of propofol. Infusion of 10 mg per kg per hour is given for the first 10 minutes, 8 mg per kg per hour for the next 10 minutes followed by 6 mg per kg per hour. So for an overview for a 70 kg person, we would need around 12 ml of 0.1% propofol for the first 1%. 10 minutes. Another 8 to 9 uh, ml for the next 10 minutes and 6 mg per kg per hour that is around 42 ml for the next 1 hour. So for a 1 hour surgery, the total propofol consumption would be around 60 ml. So recovery after procedure lasting up to 90 minutes is 5 to 10 minutes. These are the various infusion, manual infusion schemes that we have. Uh, the drugs that are commonly used uh, for infusion are highlighted. Uh, for propofol, it is 1 to 2 mg per kg uh, for loading and uh, 50 to 150 mics per kg per minute for maintenance. For fentanyl, uh, for a, a cardiac case or a, uh, for general anesthesia, we would prefer 5 to 15 mg mics per kg, although where we preferably use uh, fentanyl for analgesia purpose in a pre-medication, that is 1 to 3 mics per kg as a loading dose. Target controlled uh, infusions are computer derived infusion devices used to achieve a preset target plasma concentration of drug. Uh, for example, there is Diprefuser. Uh, these have a dual microprocessor component incorporated into an infusion uh, pump, enables to deliver propofol in TCI mode. The different examples are Marsh, Schneider, and Minto. So, why are infusions preferred? They have greater hemodynamic stability, more stable depth of anesthesia, more predictable and rapid recovery, and potential lower dose of drug is used. What is the ideal drug for TIVA? The ideal drug should be stable in solution. It should not be absorbed by plastics. It should not promote bacterial growth. No perivascular slowing if extravasated. It should have a rapid onset of action, a rapid and predictable recovery, potent and lipid soluble. And relatively cheap and should be chemical co chemically compatible with other drugs a classification of the drugs that we use for TIVA the, the GABA A potentiators that's the inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain propofol etomidate benzodiazepines and barbiturates so majority of the drugs that we use uh, work on this GABA uh, re uh, receptor and increase the inhibitory neurotransmission NMD antagonist, that is the excitatory neurotransmitter antagonism, is shown by ketamine. Alpha adrenergic agonist, that is the meditomidine. Opioid agonist, fentanyl, alfentanyl, ramifentanyl, sulfentanyl. Muscle relaxants, atrocurium and vecuronium. The adjuvants that we use for TIVA are dexamethasone, lignocaine, paracetamol, magnesium sulfate, esmolol and diclofenac. The current TIVA combinations which are very successful are ketopol, combination of ketamine and propofol, KPD that is ketamine, propofol and dexmeritomidine, dexket is dexmeritomidine and ketamine uh, combination, 
ketamine and uh, dexmedetomidine co combination also called as ketomid ultiva and propofol that is ramifentanil and propofol combination so these are few doses concentration of uh, the tiva uh, combo drugs uh, the commonly used uh, drug is ketamine plus propofol combination which is used in a one to one mixture and uh, it is widely used for shorter procedures another combination that is used is ketamine propofol plus dexmedetomidine in one is to one is to one combination and it is uh, all of these drugs uh, they minimize each other's adverse reactions for instance dexmedetomidine reduces shivering uh, caused by propofol and it helps in achieving excellent analgesia and anesthesia and provides rapid recovery the combination that is very popular is Ultiva and Propofol, that is Ramifentanil and Propofol. It is most widely used by target control infusion pumps, although not uh, currently used in India. And they can be used up to 36 hours. The other combination are using Mirazolam. Ketamine and Mirazolam is a favorite for using in non-operating room anesthesia. Uh, then Midas, Dexmed and Fentanyl infusion is used for short surgical pr procedures also provides a good pain relief and then we have magnesium sulfate and uh, dexamethasone plus lidocaine uh, combination that is used to reduce post-op nausea vomiting uh, and uh, reduces the dose of IV anesthetic agents. In summary, TIVA techniques can provide numerous advantages over volatile anesthetics. Equipment setup and cost is greater than using existing vaporizers at present, but it has an appreciable long-term savings. Improved understanding of drug kinetics, dynamics and interactions has facilitated optimal drug selection and method of administration. Modern infusion technology and TCI lens control to IV techniques to rival vaporizer use. Thank you. Thank you, Mehta, for the nice presentation. Uh, everyone agrees. I mean, it's fascinating to see how anesthesia has been involved, where we have been, where we are now, and uh, definitely a long way to go to the newer technology Speakers. and the better technology. Uh, so, I mean, uh, the pharmacokinetic, all anesthetists, they need to know the pharmacokinetic principles underpinning TIVA in order to achieve or maintain the appropriate drug concept. It's really important uh, in order to be good at so, uh, and I would like to uh, request the, all the three experts to comment on Dr. Neha's presentation and a few things about uh, how it is related to their own practice. Over to you, Dr. KK, Dr. Kushar. Dr. Subramanian. And Dr. Subramanian. <clears throat> I, will, I, I, will, I will let uh, Dr. Kekia and uh, Dr. Tusha start off. If. Um, thank you, Subramanian. Thank you for the fantastic presentation. Um, I think uh, the way TIVA TCA is taking off, uh, the first uh, point we made was what are the indications of TIVA? Is that correct? Yeah. Yes. So uh, I think we had to change the way we think now. Uh, we had to revolution the way we think. So the question actually should be, is there a reason why we cannot use TCI in this patient? That's the way we should start thinking. Not can, uh, what are the indications? No. Is there a reason why we cannot use TIVA TCI in this patient? That's the way yes, we sir. should start thinking because yes. Is that correct? Supra yeah, and definitely. Sushar will agree. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah, so this is the way we should start thinking, not the other way around. And uh, the reason is any patient you can use IV induction, you can use it for maintenance. Simple. If you are giving propofol or ketamine as an induction agent for any patient, why do you think you cannot use it for maintenance? So that's the way we should think. The advantages are numerous. The cost advantages are numerous. The advantages for patients are numerous, and as the day goes along, we'll we'll look at it in greater detail. I think this is the first thing we should uh, understand that every patient we should see why I cannot use TCI in this patient. That's that's the start. I, think. I will add, I KK, that uh, whatever the anesthesia we are giving in our lifetime, 
first thing is that the ti is the most popular now pci ti is most popular because we can give it from ot to outside ot from any neonatal patient to geriatric patient and you name the surgery where uh, we can give tci ti so there is no no uh, uh, doubt that uh, tci ti or ti techniques are uh, given in which patients so there is no like a, you said very prominently that uh, ti ECI device given to each and every patient out of the any indication whether it is for a transplant patient or whether it is for the any sort of long surgery or short surgery. So forget about the indications. TIVA TCI can or TCI can be given to each and every patient which are posted for the surgical anesthesia. Um, uh, it was a wonderful talk, uh, team IIG. Um, what uh, I want to highlight uh, in, um, over the last two or three decades, uh, the, our understanding of pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics has completely transformed. Uh, if I may, I can actually say the anesthesia is leading the way the pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics is looked at. Because we are, if you look at, I mean, I want to be more specific towards target controlled infusions. Here, we are talking about, not about the dose of the drug which we are giving. I mean, we are all used to, let's say, antibiotics, we are sort of antihypertensive. We are all giving dose per kg basis here. Here, we have moved one level up to look at the concentration in the plasma, estimated concentration in the brain, and the effect of that concentration on the particular organ. That is how the advances have happened. There has been advances. For example, the first time I used a TCI infusion was way back, nearly 20 years back, in April of 2002. After that, so much of publications have happened that we have a very, very good understanding publications which say this is the level of concentration which is needed to keep asleep. How we have done? We have used objective means, not by assessing, uh, just by that. So people have used objective means, looking at the activity in the brain, and say this is probably enough. So we have reached a stage where in which there is a reasonable published evidence to say the concentration to effect. Relationship we have understood, and we have also understood what is the dose to concentration effect as well, that is pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. So. Uh, in which we were not sure whether they will anesthetize, is there an equivalent to MAC? Those things, I think, less and less become relevant now. So, because we have a good understanding of concentration to effect relationship, and to deliver that mechanism, we have got very advanced machines, which uses the latest models and the hybrid models, which uh, Dr. Neha was talking about. So, in that way, we have reached a stage where in which we have got a very, very advanced level of uh, you know, pro providing total control target controlled intuition. What we also, I also feel is that we are in a very critical juncture because we not only have a medication that is propofol, which can be used in the form of TCI, we also are in the threshold of getting remifentanil, which can look after the analgesia aspect. So the, the amnesia aspect is being controlled by propofol, by which, which we can give by TCI, that is target controlled intuition. And the same with remifentanil, we can give analgesia it can very quick in onset and very quick in offset. So in that way, whatever is the depth of needed for analgesia and, 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 and amnesia, we have the mechanisms to deliver as quickly and as safely as possible. Thank you so much for all the valuable inputs. And definitely, we agree. And it's starting to think in such a way that for every case, why can't it be a TIVA rather than why should Voice is not there. He can't hear you. There was a bit of misconnect, uh, Dr. Lakshmi. Uh, we can't hear you, Lakshmi. Hello. Hi, now we can Can hear. you hear? Okay. <laughs> so, thank you so much for all the valuable inputs. And uh, as you rightly said, we'll start to think in such a way that for from now onwards, for every case, why can't it be done under TIVA? rather than since we have so many advantages and uh, rather than looking for an indication to do the cases under TIVA technique. Uh, Lakshmi, Lakshmi, can I suggest something for the listeners, those who are on YouTube? See, basically, 
to start TIVA or TCA TIVA, whatever way. You start with the minor cases first, without even sometimes if you are not available TCI machine, first develop that technique, develop that uh, that courage to start only TIVA. In short cases like propofol or with combination of the drugs, then you will have a confidence, then you switch over to your, but if you think that I cannot start without this inhalation agent, so that is not a good thing to start. If you have that uh, idea in your mind, then you will never start TCIT in your lifetime. So first, whatever the way you want to start, you just start with the five minutes case, 10 minutes case outside the theater, whatever the way, but develop that technique. So why I came in this TIVA technique in my lifetime since last 20 years, because of this, my child went for the some of the radiological procedure outside the theater. At that time, she was not allowing and compulsorily I have to give some TIVA agents. So that's why since last 22 years, I am doing this TIVA technique and now PCI TIVA technique. So my urge to all the listeners and in uh, those who are doing this, those who want to start this technique, they start at least day one cases for there. Then you develop your uh, courage or whatever way, then you can have further way for going to PCI TIVA. Rather than using it in as the only yes, soul, yes. because you have to do it at that point of time for certain scenario, it's yes. better to be comfortable with all the techniques so that mm. you'll give your best when the time comes that you have to give the technique that's needed for the safety of the patient. Yes, completely yes. agree, completely. And our next speaker is Dr. Trupti Gupta, and she is an alumni of Osmania Medical College, Hyderabad, and she has done her DNB anesthesia from Medanta Gurugram. She was awarded the best paper in ERAS in RSACP 2018 and she has special interest in regional anesthesia and pain management. At um, AIG Hospitals Kachibauli, we strongly believe for any sort of clinical practice that we need to set some standards and principles and recommendations for safe, uh, you know, for safety of the patient care. So, Dr. Trupti will take us through uh, the newer regimens that we established and we follow and also the guidelines for safe practice of total intravenous anesthesia. Over to you, Dr. Trupti. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I'm going to talk about newer modalities and guidelines in TIVA. But before I start talking, I would like to thank all the three esteemed faculties here for inspiring us in the field of TIVA. So as we know, TIVA is a method of inducing and maintaining general anesthesia exclusively by intravenous administered drugs without using of use of any inhalational agents including nitrous oxide. To maintain the anesthesia triangle of analgesia, hypnosis and muscle relaxation, either a single drug can be used or a combination of drug can be used. Preferably a combination of drug is preferred. So, but we should keep in mind that uh, more the drugs we use, more is the complexity and more are the interactions of the drugs. So what we, uh, as already discussed by Dr. Neha, there are different drug mixtures that are used regularly in TIVA. I would just go through them, uh, like including ketamine and dexmedetomidine, ketamine with midazolam, ketamine with propofol, ketamine with uh, lignocaine, dexamethasone, magnesium sulfate and lignocaine, propofol with dexmedetomidine and fentanyl, midazolam, dexmedetomidine and fentanyl, ketamine with propofol and dexmedetomidine, ketamine with lignocaine and fentanyl, and remifentanil or fentanyl with propofol. The most widely used mixture that is Altiva uh, Tiva is uh, the mixture of remifentanil and propofol and it is most widely used. And there are various studies which support the stability of multiple drugs mixtures. So irrespective of whatever modality we use for Tiva, it is mandatory to have certain things that is ABC support, preparedness of advanced airway, appropriate monitoring and ACLS preparedness. So coming to various methods of administering the Tiva, we have various methods like a single combination of or single drug or a combination of drugs, single syringe or multiple syringes, technique with one drug or multiple drugs, Continuous IV infusion through drips or special TIVA sets like these. Here, uh, these TIVA uh, sets are special because they are usually uh, made uh, have a lure lock and have an anti-siphon valve and an anti-reflex valve. Syringe pump uh, infusions can be used. Target control infusions that is TCI and automated drug delivery through closed loop system that is CLADS. 
Coming to single syringe TIVA, it is useful in smaller setups or short procedures. Here, the anesthetist guides the induction and the maintenance by giving short boluses. Uh, the advantage being no additional investment for TCI or closed loop system. Coming to manually control infusion, this we, reg this we were using till date uh, in AIG very regularly. Now we have recently shifted to TCI. By, uh, this can be given through two ways. First is by uh, piggybacking the IV drip. A simple gravity intravenous infusion can be piggy piggybacked to the carrier line. And the second method is the fixed infusion rate, that is pump is used and this pumps offer the advantage of being more precise dose selection, lower risk of overdose, minimal flow variation from the changes in the venous pressure of the patient or the bag height. Uh, as already discussed by my colleague Dr. Neha, uh, the most common and most uh, famous propofol manual infusion is uh, Mistral Regimen. Coming to TCI, this is a computer driven infusion device used to achieve a preset concentration of drug in the plasma or the FX site. It has main three components, first being the user interface, second is the software with the pharmacokinetic and the pharmacodynamic models which are validated for a specific drug to control the infusion rate. Third is the communication between the control unit and the pump hardware. Dr. John Glenn was the first to introduce the TCI pump for propofol known as Deprefuser. So TCI can be explained in a simple terms that an anesthetist with the prior knowledge of pharmacology of all the drugs with uh, uh, knowing the, with having all the knowledge about the covariates and the effect of covariates on the drug starts operating a TCI by first selecting a TCI model or the TCI regimen, put all the covariates in the model and then choose the effect site or the plasma concentration. As Dr. Subramanian was just saying that yes, we have gone one step ahead, we are not deciding the dose by per kg body weight. Now we are deciding the dose by choosing the effect site concentration. And during all this, the anesthetist clinically uh, monitors the patients either, like either by clinical assessment or by the electronic assessment. The clinical assessment includes these but not limited to like systolic blood pressure or the heart rate, tearing of the patient, sweat, sweating of the patient. These are uh, usually, uh, this is also known as EVAN score, which ranges from 0 to 8. 8 being patient totally awake and 0 means patient is deeply unconscious. There are other parameters that can be used for monitoring the patient like skin conductance, isolated forearm technique, spontaneous surface electromyogram, lower esophageal contractility, heart rate variation and respiratory sinus arrhythmias. Uh, I would like to take you all through a short video which we have shot in our operation theater in AIG where I am inducing a patient using a TCI pump. So after loading the syringe into the pump, I am engaging it. I am selecting the type of need, uh, syringe that is I am using. Again the type of patient that is adult or the child, choosing the pro propofol concentration and then I am entering the covariates. These covariates include uh, age of the patient, weight of the patient, height of the patient and including the gender of the patient. Yeah, after selecting the gender, I will set... Uh, so as we can see here, there are two uh, values. One is in blue color, another one is in red color. The blue one is like what is the actual effect site concentration in the patient's body. And the red CET, that's, that is nothing but what I am setting in the mo uh, monitor, the TCI monitor. And during this, I am looking at my patient and uh, looking for her level of consciousness. Slowly, I will increase the doses of the uh, uh, CET that I am setting there. And I am waiting for the target uh, effect concentration to be achieved. So once my target concentration is achieved by checking the, uh, uh, like when, when my patient is fallen asleep, I inform my technician to give the muscle relaxant. So these uh, this infusion models can be drug specific or can be general purpose. Can be single syringe, double syringe or triple syringe. There are various models that are available, but in India we have Arcomed, Elibet, Alaris, Medcaptain and Braun. Clinical benefits of uh, target control uh, uh, infusion is that we have more predictable onset of anesthesia. 
more higher stable maintenance is maintained more predictable offset of anesthetic effects so we have shorter time of recovery shorter time to discharge including low incidence of pov and thus economic there is recent advance in the tci tci uh, that has been uh, noted that there are some studies uh, published where the patient has themselves control the sedation during the surgeries thus increasing the pa patient's acceptability to tci there are various uh, tci regimens or uh, protocols being uh, published and uh, we are using nowadays including uh, these are drug specific so like for example for propo propofol we have schneider elliweld cortinus marsh prefuser and cataria out of these uh, peat fuser and cataria are for pediatric age group and for uh, remifentanil we have tci model called Mint minto fentanil has Berg uh, bergman and so on so i'll be discussing in details about few models like marsh schneiders and elliwelt coming to marsh model this was the first to be developed used uh, year before developing they have used a data from 150 patients and then this uh, was validated over next 30 patients this is a very simple model but a good model and it has been in practice since more than 30 years the only covariate that we input here is body weight so in we know that central compartment that is a v1 compartment is weight proportional other five transfer rate constants are fixed in this model so when the diffuser model that was uh, made for propofol uh, this uh, marsh model was used and uh, in that time the keo that is a rate constant that uh, uh, was not included in this model slowly the researches were made and keo value was derived for this model which ranged from 0.26 minutes to 1 minute so many commercial tci pumps used a larger that is a faster keo value of 1.1 to 1.2 minute and this is referred to as modified marsh model coming to schneider's model this is a more complex model and it was developed during combined pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamic studies here many covariates like weight height age gender of the patient and lean body mass was used this was the data was collected from healthy 24 volunteers using their arterial samples in this model the central compartment that is v1 and the slow equilibrating compartment that is v3 are fixed whereas v2 that is rapid equilibrating compartment was uh, not fixed and it is influenced by the age so the major limitation of this compartment is that the v1 that the center compartment or uh, that is volume of distribution is fixed so the initial dolus will be same for the patients of all the body weight and age let is let it be 30 kg or let it be 90 kg patients the initial dolus bolus is the same after the bolus of the given size the same predicted pre plasma concentration is achieved for all the patient which doesn't seem to be right to achieve the same plasma concentration the dose uh, administered is considerably smaller than the marsh model this accuracy has led some to believe that schneider is safer safer for more flyal patients coming to elliwelt model this is a general purpose model uh, where uh, we are using many covariates like weight age sex and administration of co medication this was uh, developed for a broad range of uh, population including adults children older subjects and obese adults uh, this uh, uh, it is an important advance as this model incorporates pharmacokinetic data derived from almost 30 previously published studies so why elliwelt is a preferred model as the algorithm in elliwelt does not depend upon lean body mass there is no limit on the weight like for example in a schneider model where the male of 50 years if the height of the male patient is 177 cm uh, the max weight would be 121 kg only whereas in elliwelt it can go up to maximum 200 so the weight range of elevate covers a very uh, huge uh, range that is 3 kg to 200 kg and elevate model incorporates the enhanced effect of delivering propofol with an opioids and adjust to it so we have two types of propo uh, uh, protocols in that first being for anesthesia that is propofol plus opioid and second is only for uh, sedation that is only propofol what we use at our setup is acromed uh, uh, model which uses elevate regime another way of giving tiva is closed loop anesthesia delivery system that is or also known as automated tiva here the input is through the different syringe pumps the output is along with the vital sign monitoring we even do depth monitoring 
So what is the need for TV uh, like what, all these latest latest gadgets in the TV monitoring? Awareness during anesthesia. We know that awareness during anesthesia has many bad effects like bad dreams, insomnia, anxiety, including uh, post traumatic stress disorder. So this should be understood that monitoring depth of anesthesia is a vital part of TIVA. We know depth monitors that are uh, being used during uh, TIVA have seen a uh, lots of evolution from 1996 where BIS was introduced till date. In our setup we use regularly use BIS that is bispectral index. Bispectral index converts a single channel of frontal EEG into an index of hypnotic level and we target for the value of 40 to 60 to prevent awareness. Various other models include Entropy, Narcotrend, EQCon, Sedline Brain Function Monitoring, Phonox, Nociception Monitoring, Danmeter APS and other evoke potentials like Somatosensory Evoke Potential, Visual Evoke Potential and Auditory Evoke Potential. So why do we need any guidelines for TIVA? So they, uh, during the fifth national audit proje uh, project on accidental awareness during general anesthesia, it was found that the most cases of awareness that were reported were done under TIVA and most of these cases were preventable. The commonest contributive factor was inadequate education and training among the anesthetists. So post which many societies and many associations have come up with the guidelines and we are lucky enough to have Dr. Tushar Choksi with us because sir is the founder of Tiva Society of India and I'm going to discuss the guidelines that have been uh, laid down by Society of Intravenous Anesthesia and the Association of Anesthetists. The guidelines are all the anesthetists should be trained and competent in the delivery of Tiva. And when we are planning to give any general anesthesia using propofol infusion, its TCI pump is preferred. Whenever you are starting a, a target concentration, it should be chosen depending on various characteristics of the patient, co-administered drugs and clinical situation. Always use a lower initial target propofol concentration for older, frail and unwell patients. It is always preferred to stock only one concentration of propofol. Like in a department, there should not be two concentration of propofol, that is one person and two person. This can create complications or drug errors. And, uh, and there should be a standardized single uh, drug dilution uh, to be used in a particular department. For example, remifentanil worldwide, we use four micrograms per ml as a drug concentration, uh, which is standardized. The infusion set that we use for TIVA should have a lure lock connector and an anti-siphon valve and an anti-reflex valve. Always use the drug and the fluid in line as, and as close as possible to the patient to avoid the dead space. The infusion pump should be programmed only after the syringe containing the drug to be infused has been placed inside the pump. Always see to it that your IV cannula or the central venous catheter is visible to you throughout the anesthesia. Anesthetists should be familiar with the principal interpretation and limitation of process EEG monitoring. When TIVA is administered outside the operating room, same standard of care is to be taken during monitoring also. Let it be OT or let it be NORA. And there are certain uh, practical approach or practical guidance given for the pediatric age group also. Like for example, if we are planning to give target control infusion that if you have TCI models like Pete Fuser Cataria, please go for it. Cataria is uh, uh, usually the weight range is 15 to 61 kg, whereas Pete Fuser, the, uh, Pete Fuser, the weight range is 5 to 61 kg. Whereas if we don't have a TCI pump, then the manual infusions, different schemes have been explained by McFarland and Stewart. Stewart, uh, those schemes are for age less than three years of, uh, three years of age and uh, McFarlane, uh, the age is three to 11 years. In this, in, let it be pediatric, uh, in the pediatric age group, the propofol, if we are using as a steady uh, solo agent, then the uh, concentration at the effect site is to be achieved at four to six mics per ml. And if we are using propofol along with any adjuvant, uh, the concentration at the effect site that can be targeted will be 3 to 4 mics per ml. What are the other adjuvants that can be used like any opioid, any uh, NMDA uh, antagonist like ketamine, alpha 2 agonist like dexmedomidine or clonidine and benzodiazepines like midazolam. The, uh, to avoid any drug delivery prob problems, the guidelines are almost similar to the adult including uh, using the P uh, process EEG monitoring. 
but eeg monitoring is preferred when the child is more than 4 uh, one year of age because the uh, algorithm uh, um, like it is not that is not reliable in the children less than one year of age and algorithms can be based on adult eeg data that has to be confirmed before starting monitoring and it the abnormal eeg patterns can also seen in patients with uh, or pediatric patients with cerebral palsy to conclude yes tiva is safe and cost effective Elevel regime is supposedly and currently preferred for Tiva. Yes, Tiva is environmental friendly. So, as I have already mentioned earlier, we have to be prepared for ABC support always, preparedness of advanced airway, appropriate monitoring, and ACL is preparedness. Thank you. Good presentation, Dr. Drupti. Thank you. So, I would like to in, um, request any expert comments. On Dr. Trupti's presentation, please, before we open the uh, floor for panel discussion. It was very nice presentation. Both of both the speaker were very nice and to the point. Thank you. So I think they have covered everything. What else we can say? <laughs> <laughs> no, but still, uh, I must tell the audience and uh, my colleagues that uh, all of okay. them have their, developed their own regimes and. Uh, Tushar Choksi infusion regime, TCI regime. <laughs> he has his own <laughs> regime. And, but I would uh, like to hear from uh, Dr. Uh, K.K. and Subramaniam, uh, uh, like how to initiate uh, TIVA in complex cases, like suppose if I'm doing a long surgery, uh, uh, how do we initiate and how do we maintain and how do we titrate? Like suppose if I don't have this monitor, then how do I titrate the concentration? Anybody? KK, you want to go first? Yeah, Dr. KK can begin. Uh, thank you, Sunil. Uh, excellent presentation. Uh, really, really well uh, researched and uh, you covered many. Thank you so much. Very, very enlightening. We learned a lot from you. Uh, so sorry to interrupt. I think some of the content of both the talks were borrowed from uh, all three of your speakers, uh, PowerPoint, which is there on the Google. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Tushar, I must acknowledge, yes. <laughs> no, 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 it's okay. But uh, okay. actually, it was very nice presentation, really. <laughs> Correct, yeah. I so, uh, before I answer your question, how to get uh, colors from. Yeah. Okay. So, may I make two comments before answering your question, please, Sunil? Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I think the first one, what scares people about TCI is mathematics. Yes. Uh, the, one of the reasons why we all became doctors is we don't have to do mathematics in our life. We can do PCB and we can forget M. So when you talk about microgram per kg, nanogram per kg, it scares people. Oh, I may make mistake. Uh, so the biggest advantage, uh, what has happened now is we have combined artificial intelligence uh, use the technology to avoid us doing all these mistakes in mathematics. So now it's pretty much like your Google map or GPS. So you set the location and you press start and it will take you, it will tell you exactly what to do. So your TCI pump is going to do exactly the same. So you don't have to do any mathematics. You can sit back, relax, you set the target. You Very nice video which uh, she showed. So she set the target, the machine is doing all the work for her which is it's doing the calculation for the effect. All the work is done by the artificial intelligence. So that is good because people should not be scared of mathematics anymore. The machine is doing the work for you. I think that is important to understand because this is what has stopped TCI from progressing. So that is one. Second concept I want to talk about is uh, the term general anesthesia so far. Uh, the reason why it has remained general is we use one ampule of everything so far for all the patients. Is that correct? You ask anyone uh, how much propofol, one ampule. Uh, whatever the body weight of the patient, whatever the height of the patient, we are not specific. One ampule on tensetron, take some of this on one. Is that correct or am I making this up? Get to an extent, yes. Correct, yeah. yeah. So I think we have to move from this concept to patient specific anesthesia, which is you have to provide anesthesia specific for that patient. I think it's absolutely crucial, which is what this pump. So when she was setting up the pump, I think everyone noticed she put the patient's height, weight. Is it correct? It calculated the BMI automatic, the gender of the patient, 
then you set the target which means whatever you are providing is specific for this patient so the a the machine is doing the mathematics and b i think for first time we are providing patient specific anesthesia rather than just a general anesthesia i think when we are so particular about everything in life dress we wear the pen we want the mobile phone we want the shoes we wear the coffee we drink we are very very particular but when it comes to anesthesia it's always general i think we need to move from when we don't respect our specialty no one else is going to so we have to move from general to patient specific anesthesia so mathematics by machine patient specific anesthesia i hope uh, that's the message has come through uh, uh, next second thing kk i want to add that here uh, after conducting since last 3 to 4 years all this workshop on tca divine pan india i got the question that uh, sir it is is it very commercial to start tci with uh, so much of uh, mush buttons and everything then i say the simple example of auto driven car see when you are driving driving a car from uh, manual gear to auto gear then how do you do that job so kk has rightly said that you uh, send it to all your mathematics to this machine and machine will take over all your pains about all the pharmacology and all mathematics and everything so basically my message to those who are listening that okay, those who are asking okay, sir the machine is very this pci machine is very costly it is very cumbersome to start it is very lengthy to like it takes 5 6 minutes to start i don't think that like at the age of 50 60 years of my uh, uh, of my age or sunil's age we when we learn something from our juniors our colleagues then why not other people can learn and we have to accept the changes whatever is coming in this world so proper message is that okay, try start giving your all uh, pain to machines and machine will take you the very easy and that is the called target control infusion so basically you have to change your mindset rather than the the set criteria that okay, I am comfortable to giving anesthesia since last so many years. So then why should I change my practice? So that is not the message for all workshop of this type of the webinars. Please change your practice level. Just to continue on the similar thought process, um, the way uh, I mean I have seen or uh, my experience has gone through is uh, this Robert, Bristol model or Roberts Chris Roberts model came somewhere in the end of the uh, 1990s. Uh, we had a few seniors who were very enthusiastic. We started using it uh, based on the formula, on the uh, in dose of one milligram per kg of propofol, uh, followed by you know infusion for the first ten minutes, ten next ten minutes, ten eight and six for the next ten and continue at six. The problem we had was uh, we there was publications to say that it probably is estimating that the concentration in the plasma is likely to be three. We never had estimates what is in the in the in the brain. Uh, is there is there something wrong with it? It was it effective? It was fairly effective. This had started to come in early 2000s. People had started to show yes, people is asleep, patient is asleep. But what has happened is after that, people started thinking, no, is it complicated formula? Can I develop any you know uh, modeling wherein which is easy to calculate? They came up with calculators based on Excel sheets first. And then they came up with the apps. When the app started, they started using passive TVAS, where in which there's apps which tell you when to change to which dosage. And now we have machines which have incorporated all those things and delivers in a very, very precise manner. These advanced pumps are like, you know, modern generation, you know, absolutely modern. So, I mean, uh, what I see is in the near future, we will have two sets of anesthetists one who are comfortable using TIVA or TCI, the other one who is yet to be made comfortable. In the near future, in the, everyone has to learn. So I think we, we've started a process where in which we are learning. There's a lot of learning to happen because most of the learning what we have in publications is from the Western literature. So we, we, we have very, very minimal publications from India. So we don't know actually what is the you know, effect, the concentration to effect in Indian population. So uh, that is where we go. And if you ask me how I started using it, first initially we need to understand what is the relationship between the effect and the, and the concentration the effect. So initially it started with using uh, the target controlled infusion for simple procedures, but in which I'm using it as a sedation. 
For example, you have an anxious patient. They are under spinal anesthesia or some regional block. You want to understand what is the relationship between the concentration which you have targeted and the sedation which you see. So it was, is it 0.5? Is it 1, 1.5? What is it before the block? What is it after the block? All this gets you into a mood that in which our mind gets in sync with, oh, this patient probably needs around 1, 1.5, 2. So the same thing will happen with general anesthesia. So we went through a learning process wherein which we were using BIS monitoring for a lot of cases. So wherein which we, you know, you have an understanding, oh, this is too deep. Believe me, if you are targeting the what you traditionally told, the same number as 4 to 6, I have seen on BIS monitoring wherein which it easily goes into the suppression ratio. In the BIS monitors, we have, you know, two or three values which are coming up. One is the number which says what is the depth. We all you know, try to aim between 40 and 60. But if you closely monitor at the same levels what we are giving, plenty of patients are going into a rhythm wherein which the ECG is EG suppressed and there is burst suppression. So we still have a way to understand what is the effect of the, you know, what is the concentration which leads to that effect in Indian population. But uh, but to help us guide still that way is what we have is the use of basic parameters. That is, we have the patient's age, we have the patient's weight, we have the patient's gender, this is taken into calculation of the fundamental models. All we are still relying, we are as of now, is the models which have been created on the Western population and the Western body weights. We may be, few of you in the future, will develop our own Indian modification, the same models. Thank you. Thank you. Thank yes. you. And um, for majority of our cases, we follow ERAS protocol. So when you compare the balancer technique and the pure TIVA technique, is there a significant difference in the recovery times? It has E to be precise. <laughs> it has E to be precise, yeah. <laughs> so is there a difference in the recovery times? Or you believe that it depends on the titration of the technique that we use either way? So shall I take the question first? <clears throat> yes, please. Okay. Um, now, uh, one of the, uh, you know, if we look at the, what patients don't want to have after surgery, uh, there are a number of gradings which have been used, what patients don't want to have after the surgery is they don't want to have nausea and vomiting, they don't want to have shivering, they don't want to, uh, you know, they expect some pain, they expect some pain, but they don't want to have nausea and vomiting, they don't want to have shivering. These go on the top of the rating which they don't want to have. If you are aiming as this part of the ERAS protocol, which one scores well here? TIVA scores very well because the nausea, I mean, if you look at the N and T, uh, the, the traditional uh, the medicines which we use for prophylaxis like uh, dexamethasone or ondansetron, they have an NT of 5. That means if, for every 5 patients you use, one patient will not have nausea and vomiting because of what we have given. What is the NNT of TIVA? Again, it is 5. It is almost equivalent to giving one prophylaxis. That means if somebody is prone for nausea and vomiting, it might almost become a standard. Then shivering. We, what do you do if the patient has shivering? We have started on propofol infusion or dexamethasone infusion. So volatiles, uh, and the, then if you look at pain aspect, so volatiles augment the pain. So whereas this reduces the, you know, uh, the uh, post procedure analysia become it reduces with this. The only thing what we think sometimes, if you especially if you compare to desflurane, is to the moment you switch off desflurane, we almost have a patient who is waking up clearly in five minutes. But with propofol, it is not as quick as that. But when they wake up, they are very, very clear-headed. They can answer, they can tell you your bank account number, what is the balance in the bank. That is what it is there. So you know, that, that is the clarity of thought when their recovery is there. So on table, what I have found is the recovery is probably slightly longer because we have a little bit of learning curve. That means we don't, I mean, we have an estimate on the machine to say, if you, I mean, based on the concept of, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, context sensitive half time we have the machines tell us when the concentration will come down from the current level which is two or three mm -hmm. particular level that that gives an estimate when you, they might be ready to shift but when they wake up the clarity in the head is absolutely marvelous so it, has, it will become a fantastic tool to you know make sure that the patients recover quickly and clear-headed and they, they go to uh, the pack your time will be very less the recovery is almost happening when they, as they as they recover. I'm totally agree with Dr. Mankali because it is my personal experience. When two years back, when I went for the spinal surgery myself at L1, L2 liver with acute uh, prolapse, and at that time I told to my anesthetist that can you give one 
permit uh, only TCA Diva. And you won't believe that when I uh, just uh, came out from the theater and uh, I was just giving the victory sign to my anesthetist within five minutes. And at uh, within one hour, I was taking my water and at night time, I had gone to my home. So it was fantastic because see, when I was giving Tiva and TCA Tiva in my lifetime since last 20 years, then why not it, it, it should be given to myself. So my experience is best and that is no doubt it. So I'm totally agree with Dr. Mankali. There is no, absolutely. And if you think that in nine, since last 30 years, how many inhalation agents are invented? And since last 30 years, you see every two years, new drugs are coming in TCIT market. So we are benefited with now, nowadays we are, we are for, fortunate enough to have more than 25 drugs in our armamentarium, intravenous drugs. So what else you require? And every six months, new machines are coming in the form of like Acromed, uh, this Elevate model came, then this from Snyder to Mars to this. And you need, you see, how much vaporizer changes are there? So I'm very much uh, in positive part of TCIT. Believe me. Yeah. So uh, Neha has a question. Yeah, tell me. Uh, so my question is to Dr. Karunakaran. Sir, what is your experience with TCI Tiva in hemodynamically unstable patients? And is there any need to change the regimes that we use? Uh, thank you. Very, very important and interesting question. Uh, not just in hemodynamically unstable, and I'm just going to mention this for all the patients you're going to start with, uh, is always start low, uh, go up gradually, see how your patient responds, and then uh, take it from there. So, uh, Sunil, you asked a question earlier, and I'm going to combine both the questions and try to answer. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah absolutely fine. Yeah. So how to how to start? Uh, it's almost like uh, how do you prepare a plane for takeoff? It's pretty much like that. So how do you start your anesthetic with the uh, Tiva TCI? Uh, so uh, let me give you a practical way of doing it. Uh, the way is you have your patient's height, weight and demographics much before the patient comes in. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes. OK, so you can set your pump just the way you draw up other anesthetic agents before the patient comes. So your pump is ready to go. Correct? Yes. Okay. As soon as the patient comes, you cite your IV cannula. Make sure you connect your uh, infusion correctly. You do WHO checklist there? Yeah, absolutely. 100%. Okay, absolutely. 100%. So, as soon as you start your WHO checklist, when you check confirm the patient's name, start at a low dose, 0.3 to 0.5. That's it, especially with A level. That is the way you start. So, start with a very low dose. Uh, and start when you're doing the WHO checklist and give the patient to hold the mask. All the patients know how to hold the mask and breathe oxygen. So your pre-oxygenation is done while you're still doing a WHO checklist. So you're not wasting time. I'm, I'm being conscious about time uh, when the patient is there. Okay. So by the time your WHO checklist is done, uh, A, these are the things which have happened. So the patient has received a small bolus of propofol, which is 0.3 to 0.4. So what does this help you? And Dr. Neha, your question is getting answered now, is this will show how your patient is going to respond to the next bolus of propofol. So what are the advantages of this? One is it shows how your patient is going to respond to a small bolus of propofol and then the next with bolus of propofol. Number two, patient is pre-oxygenated. Number three, your actual induction dose of propofol will come down because your brain is already, the patient's brain is sensitized. Uh, number four, when you give a big bolus of propofol, suppose you set a high target, it's always painful when you give propofol. Whereas if you have already given a small dose of propofol, this is taken care of. I hope it's making sense. So start with a small TCI. So you have a question, so we'll, we'll answer that. So that's the best way to start. So this way, pre oxygenation is done, uh, patient is uh, set. So then you set your actual target uh, and then uh, you can proceed. Whatever your target is, three or four or Okay, the machine is doing all the calculations. Number two, I would suggest is please check when you lose the verbal contact with the patient. So when, when in the monitor which you are showing in the video, you have the plasma target and the effect target. Yeah, ET and E. 
So the effect will tell you when the just observe when the patient is losing verbal contact. That's a very good. Usually it will be one to one point two. So it doesn't need big target for loss of verbal contact. If you're talking to the patient, talking something nice, and you will notice at the target of one or one point two, you lose verbal contact, which means at the end of surgery. This is probably where the patient is going to regain verbal contact. I hope it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's a simple and easy way to start. How do you start? And I hope, Dr. Neha, that has answered your question also. So someone is hemodynamically unstable, uh, whether you use vapor or whether you use uh, IV, the principle is always the same because both can compromise their uh, uh, hemodynamics very easily. It does not matter whether you use IV or Paper, it's how you use and how much you use. I, I have I answered your question. Yes, sir. So thank you. Sir. Tripti has a so, question. Yeah. Uh, just a I'm small an, uh, question related to what we discussed now. Suppose we have a unstable patient coming in for surgery, hemodynamically unstable patient already on vasopressors. Um, since you have lot of practice, I mean lot of uh, expertise in it, would you prefer a particular regimen? combination of drugs that you will think that superior or helps you with maintaining or helps you in not deteriorating the patient hemodynamics even further do you have a specific resume in your mind the modification of or the resume or the uh, combination of the drugs that you think is very helpful so my uh, once again before answering that uh, i think tushar elevated and supra also elevated start with simple cases first Please get familiarized with your machines and your local population before going for hemodynamically unstable patient. I think this is key. You must know your machine. You must know how your local population reacts. Once you're happy with this, only and only then go for complicated patients. Uh, I cannot emphasize this enough because there is an audience listening. I cannot see the audience uh, because they should not start with the critically ill patient first with TCA. That's the wrong way to start TCA. Uh, Tushar, I think, said start with someone who has already had a spinal anesthetic. And that is where you start. You understand the machine. You see how your local population respond. Then your normal general anesthesia without paralysis. Then anesthesia with paralysis. Once you're comfortable with this, only and only then you go for hemodynamically unstable patient. So the regime is continue your vasopressors. Start with uh, low target and gradually build up your target. So, for example, in the video, uh, the target went up very quickly because you want to induce quickly. Is that correct? Yes. Whereas here, you would pre-oxygenate the patient so that uh, they're well oxygenated and you don't struggle with the airway. You go up with target of 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. And if you need to increase your vasopressor simultaneously, please do that. Uh, which medications? You can use any combination. So. I think remifentanil is not, it must have come in India now. In not yet. Fifth. Not it, not it. So supposed to be released today, isn't it? S supposed to be. <laughs> supposed to be, but not. Okay. So uh, I think if you are hemodynamically unstable, a combination of propofol and ketamine is sensible, especially if you don't have any. Because ketamine will uh, neutralize the uh, supra. Please feel free to disagree with me. That's absolutely fine. I think uh, that's a sensible regime to start with. If but that's not the first patient you do. Uh, so that should be kind of the last patient you would start with. Okay. Uh, shall I add a little bit, Dr. Lakshmi? Uh, shall I add a few things? Uh, okay. Now, uh, I mean, Dr. KK has highlighted a lot of things. But a few things which I want to say, uh, which helps us understand these TCI models better is, uh, when we use these TCI models, there are two kinds of targeting which we do. Uh, one, uh, one is the plasma targeting, other one is the effect site targeting. The effect site means here in this case, the brain. Uh, in if most of the cases when I do, I use effect site targeting. You know, all those healthy patients, I use effect site targeting because the aim is to achieve amnesia and depth of anesthesia as quickly as possible. I'm not worried about their hemodynamics because they're usually, they can compensate for this. So when we use effect site, what happens is the plasma levels shoot up, up at least three times what you have set, right? If you have set a plasma a brain targeting of three, to get that 
level in the brain as quickly as possible, the plasma level jumps up by around three times what you have said. So that is in the aim to achieve as quickly as possible the, uh, the target site concentration. Now, what are we targeting now? Our target site is brain. But what we also know is these medications have a target effect on other organs as well. What are the other organs which we generally are worried about? It is the hemodynamic parameters, vasculature and the heart. So at what point, at what level those side effects start to appear, it probably depends on the speed at which it is happening. So as a result, when we use effect site targeting, the plasma levels go up very rapidly, leading to hemodynamic fluctuations, which sometimes is not favorable in a patient who is hemodynamically unstable. What do we do? There are two things which we can do. One is use plasma targeting. Right? The other one is titrated levels of effect site targeting. What is plasma targeting? What, what it means is, let's say, for example, you have started with zero. You start a plasma level of one, two, go up to three. The level will not go above three at any cost. The plasma level will not go. What is the side effect what we have? To reach the effect in the brain, it takes longer. Instead of reaching in one and a half minutes, or three, or, 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 you know, or, or, you know, we generally take three to five arm brain circulation as a time to equilibrate in the brain. Here it takes longer, 15 minutes to equilibrate, or less than or 10 minutes to equilibrate. So in that way, it keeps the hemodynamics very stable at the cost of uh, you know, slow deepening of the sleep. So what you have advantage, if you, have, you want to gain an advantage, you add another quantification, that is to see, look at the BIS parameter. In those sick patients, the same things what we do in other places apply. We want to pre-oxygenate, we want to give medic pre-medication with fentanyl, we want to ensure well, the patient that uh, the pre-medication which we have given has started to work. All those essential things still are relevant. Do we need to monitor hemodynamics? Yes, you need to put an arterial line. The same thing holds good. Here, the only thing is, instead of dialing the vaporizer, we are dialing this up. Do we need to go 7% or you know, reach a target of 4 No, we can go slowly up. If, it's, if you want a rapid sequence induction, where you want patient to be completely asleep in a matter of 20 seconds or 40 seconds, then you target 5 target track, you can do that. But if you want a patient you are, who is hemodynamically, you can expect them to be unstable, then slowly target. One is plasma. Other one is if you use effect targeting, start at 1.5, go up to 2, go up to 2.5, and then see, because you are assured that patient is not, is not full stomach, so they will not uh, aspirate. So in that way, you can go slowly tighten it up, and whatever level we, we see that patient has gone unconscious, you can target 20 I mean, 20% above that to make sure that you are asleep. For beginners, would you recommend using a BIS monitor? I think it's really Hello. Mike, Mike. Hello. For beginners who are trying to uh, get well versed with TIVA, would you recommend using a BIS monitor? Shall I take, take that, Supra? Yeah, 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 okay. Please. So, um, this, this concept of awareness, I think people are really scared of awareness. Is that correct? Yes. Tiva means uh, almost uh, guaranteed awareness. This is the concept. So uh, this is a very wrong concept, especially with TCI. Uh, let me tell you, almost every study will find out that uh, uh, the problem is not with the model. The problem is always us. Uh, I think... Uh, in the presentation, she really well elucidated what are the problems, why awareness has happened. So, so using this question, I'm going to just take you through some safety tips uh, to avoid awareness, and I will answer your question about uh, depth of anesthesia monitoring. Is that okay? Yes, yeah, yeah. Okay. So always have a system. Either go from the machine to the patient, or go from the patient to the machine. So you must always have a system in place so that you don't make errors. So let me tell you what are the commonest errors and why awareness happens. Number one is IV cannula. Uh, you may laugh at me, and the amount of times I go into an OR and see that the cannula is tissue during the case is, uh, I'm sure you all uh, experience the same, is shocking. It, it's, it's not rare in hospitals, it's very, very common. So how is your anesthetic actually going to the patient in the in TIVA TCI? Through a cannula, correct? So if your cannula is not working, uh, please 
then you don't blame the model or don't blame the machine. Uh, the problem is cannula is not working, number one. Number two, so you have to see if you can see the cannula all the time. That is rule. If you cannot see, please make sure it is working well and it is secured well. Number two is please make sure it uh, the, lock. the lock is well tightened. Okay. So uh, I'm not joking. Uh, again, this has happened. Uh, Supra will confirm. So many times you walk and the floor is white because the propofol is going on the floor. So again, you cannot blame the machine for this. Okay. When you are delivering an anesthetic through intravenous route, you have to make sure the cannula is working well and the, it, the fluid is correctly connected. Number three, please make a loop and stick so that it doesn't get dragged. Uh, Anti-reflex valve, you mentioned, or one-way valve. The reason why this is important is the TCI machine is pushing the medication at very high pressure, almost at 1200 ml per uh, minute. Suppose you have a fluid and the TCI connected to the same line, to the same uh, thing. So where do you think least resistance medication? Part. It will go into the clamp. Correct. It will go into the fluid because it's going at very high pressure. All right. So this is why the anti-reflex or one-way valve is important. Is this all making sense? Why awareness happens? Awareness happens if the medication does not go into the patient. The problem is not the pump. So next, I'm going from the patient into the machine. So next, coming to the machine itself. So she mentioned about choosing the correct concentration of propofol. So what concentration of propofol do you have in your unit? Is it 1% or 2%? 1%. 1%. Very good. So many hospitals are 2% or many hospitals are 1%. So when you select your model, if you have 1%, you must select 1%. What will happen if you select 2%? Uh. You understand the problem? Yeah. Okay. So you have to choose 1% correctly. Okay. So if you have chosen the correct patient, height, weight and correct model, I, I just mentioned to you that when you are doing your induction, you look at what effect the patient loses verbal contact. And usually it's 1 to 1.2. Does not lead out of uh, effect side for the patient to lose uh, verbal contact. So when you are inducing the patient, if your patient loses verbal contact at say 1.5 and your target is running at 3 and you are absolutely confident the medicine is actually going to the patient. Do you think the patient is going to be aware or do you think the patient is going to be asleep? You Sorry, this is a question this. to you. <laughs> <laughs> so, where do you think the problem is? For most awareness, when they looked at it, either it was fixed concentration. So, they are using a T1, not TCI, which means where there is varying surgical stimulus and they are running a fixed concentration. Or, almost always it is running, if you go from the patient into the machine, there is some kind of error in this chain. Either the cannula is tissued, or it's not correctly connected, there is no one-way valve, or the cannula is not secured properly, or if you go to the machine and they've chosen the wrong concentration of propofol, or uh, one of these things, one of these things. So if you're worried with the TCI that you need to increase the concentration, so you go from three to four, how many seconds does it take for the concentration to go from three to four? It's very quick. Am I, am I right or wrong? Hello? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Absolutely. yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So the question about depth of anesthesia monitoring is if your basics are all correct for spontaneously ventilating patient, uh, it's very unlikely you need unless it's like a spine surgery or neurosurgery where uh, that's a that's a different concept where you need the patient to wake up and all that. So that's a different concept. But I'm saying general bread and butter surgeries for a spontaneously ventilating patient. If you have done all your basics right from the patient into the machine, uh, very unlikely you will need your depth of anesthesia monitor. For all paralyzed patients, whether you use vapor or intravenous agent, it does not matter. The recommendation is you must have depth of anesthesia monitor, yep. whichever you have. So this is the recommendation. What you do on real life, that's different. So for a spontaneously ventilating patient, bread and butter surgery, you don't need depth of anesthesia monitor. Uh, has that answered your question? Yes, yeah. yes. So no yes. matter how okay. much artificial intelligence we're been incorporating in our practice, human. we definitely need a human touch and brain, right? Very good. <laughs> to Don't make sure this job. is all we, intact. And <laughs> let's keep telling that and so we, our jobs are safe. <laughs> I think... Uh, Thank you. Yeah, we are coming towards the end, but just two quick questions. Uh, 
one is the dreaming in tiva have you ever uh, experienced like this is sometimes we just keep him in emergence earlier days we used to see that they have gone on roller coaster ride and other things uh, of course we don't see no longer those things are seen but uh, there have been few case reports where they have uh, patient they experience some dreaming under tiva and then pain recall again it's linked to awareness only but have you experienced any one of uh, you uh, in my please share yeah. uh, uh, i mean uh, it is said uh, the sleep the the medication induced sleep is no uh, similar to uh, the normal sleep or dreaming but what i can share from my experience is i have had more hugs from patients who have received tiva especially for short procedures when i was practicing in uk than who have not had tiva so okay. whether it is dreaming or uh, the feeling of what it is but definitely people are much more uh, with it and a few more tight hugs i have had from ladies <laughs> there have been again few more case uh, papers and case studies where they have uh, activated apoptosis and uh, neurocognitive effects of uh, T1 on a long term uh, or geriatric population. So any experience uh, or any light on this aspect, neurocognitive behavior and apoptosis. Okay. So can I can I answer that, Subram? Yeah, please, please. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so this is an ongoing, um, uh, ongoing issue for a very long time now. Uh, which is uh, does anesthesia affect neurocognitive function, especially in elderly elderly population, uh, postoperative cognitive dysfunction and things like that. So they looked at from regional anesthesia to general anesthesia with TIVA TCI to vapor and uh, looked at differences in uh, uh, in variety of aspects. Uh, to quote in a nutshell, in a nutshell, uh, compared to vapor. Uh, it is much less. Hello. Yeah. It's much less with the TVA TCA. That's the that's the evidence so far. Uh, it's not conclusive evidence. It's not a big big evidence. But the evidence so far is, if you compare with vapor versus uh, TVA TCI, the cognitive dysfunction is less. I hope we, I've answered that short and succinct. Uh, Rather I than. Think a, the, I think Dr. Pandya had two parts in that. Uh, other one was probably about. Uh, Exposure of uh, in infants is that right, Doctor Sunil? Yes, 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 yes. That also. Yes. Mm. When with puberty, it's fairly clear, and there is no confusion at all. If somebody is confused, has a cognitive dysfunction, uh, I would probably choose propofol in them. So if I use propofol, it probably prevents them because they wake up much clear headed. Yes. Whereas early exposure to propofol uh, are in uh, cells in precondition, you know. Uh, there, were a, there was a hype around 15 years back, uh, exposing the cardiac tissue, uh, for example, to uh, certain concentrations of volatiles. It preconditions it, and uh, later on it was found that uh, there is no basis for that. Um, uh, with this, I, I have not found any clear evidence to say either this way or that way. But what, uh, uh, what from a few friends and uh, studies which I have done is, if it is possible to avoid exposure to either volatiles or to uh, any kind of anesthetics, it probably is better for the developing brain, especially when the developing brain is there. So, I mean, probably Dr. Sunil has a more idea about this because he's, uh, you know, uh, one of the experts in that field where uh, he has gone into depth of understanding and what to use in a mid trimester, late trimester, uh, or early infants. So, Dr. Sunil, <laughs> your thoughts? No, basically, you see, we have used a uh, lot of uh, dexmedetomidin in uh, OB patients, OB, all OBGs. In fact, uh, we use dexmedetomidin as an induction process. We started about half an hour before as an infusion. To mainly because we use GA in optics when reg uh, regional is contraindicated. And most of them, they have sort of a, either preeclampsia, health or eclamptics and uh, hepatitis disorders, where we want to blunt the sympathetic response to laryngoscopy and also the extubation response. And we have found dexmedetomidin as a wonder molecule in this subset of patients. And of course, we have not had any neurocognitive behavioral changes in the newborn. Uh, but yes, those are, as I said, GAs are small in number. So we don't have the exact uh, data. But to an extent, yes, it does not have much of uh, effect on neuromuscular, I mean, behavioral changes in the newborns. That's correct. Thank you. Yeah. 
recently i just i was uh, going through uh, you know uh, when in my days when we started uh, propofol was never used for uh, induction in, uh, in in obstetrics but now there are studies which have come out uh, you know, is not used now in, uh, yes, is not used now. Now. <laughs> only propofol so, is used <laughs> so uh, the, both propofol as well as remifentanil do cross the placental barrier so and uh, there have been studies coming out with uh, like measurement of concentration of propofol in the maternal blood as well as in the uh, mm -hmm. you know uh, umbilical artery umbilical vein uh, uh, if you are using normal dosages are targeting less than 3 uh the concentrations in the uh, in the fetus after delivery is still said to be fairly low it doesn't cause sedation that is what is the yeah. looks like is going to be the concept but uh, um uh, if it's less than 2.5 i think uh, i mean as long as the incision to delivery or induction to delivery is less uh, even in those cases the concentration is too low uh, that that's what the studies yeah. seem to show you're right absolutely right <laughs> I think we are almost close to yes. the end of the webinar. And um, for quick summary, um, I think the last uh, final two bits that we can take from this webinar, as our experts rightly said, uh, we have to move in the direction of from general anesthesia to patient-specific anesthesia, uh, which is a golden point from this webinar. And in achieving, in going towards in the direction of patient-specific anesthesia, I think total intravenous anesthesia, using the recent technology, using the target-controlled infusion pups, definitely helps us, uh, you know, to excel in that direction. So mm -hmm. that's definitely, that's a point worth taking. And uh, as he rightly said, take baby steps one day at a time, rather than jumping ahead with the, you know, big guns just go ahead with one step at a time use for uh, smaller duration cases with perfectly healthy patients see how your technique helps you and also try to develop your own regimens for your own patient uh, population population and, uh, yeah. because it's also it's not just the patient specific i think it's also depends on uh, the team members that you are working with the whether it's surgical specific surgeons or whether it comes to surgical stimulus the type of surgical technique they use the duration of the surgery i think it's a multifactorial so i think uh, it's better if you develop your own regimen only after understanding the whole technique of it understanding the pharmacokinetic principles of it and also the pumps that you are using when you have the holistic approach i think we'll do justice uh, for what we are doing trying to do for the patient care uh, so anything that we missed feel free to yeah. add uh, and it is uh, extremely cost effective and patient friendly so just the last two points uh, cost effective because the most expensive part of your anesthetic is your or time and paco time okay so your or time in india I think it's 30,000 rupees per hour. In Western countries, it's like uh, 16 pounds per minute uh, in, in UK. And I think it's very similar in US. So uh, the wake up time is a very useful indicator. So if you think your surgeon is going to finish in 10 minutes, uh, you can start. Don't switch off the pump, reduce to one and leave it there, the target, reduce to one and leave it there. Because if the surgeon doesn't finish in 10 minutes, you can always go up on the target again. That's that's easy. So if you stop, then it's difficult. Uh, but this will uh, pretty much ensure your patient wakes up as the surgeon is finishing the surgery. So your turnaround time, usually which is 10, 15 minutes, will drastically reduce. So that's number one. You can prepare very clear-headed patients, so you can take them to PACU. So in fact, you're, you will start noticing your PACU nurses will say, sir, is it regional anesthesia? Madam, is it regional anesthesia? That's how clear it is they will be. Uh, third will be, you can prepare for your next occasion, have a nice cup of coffee in between because the war stuff still have to clean and get ready for the next. So you get a nice break in between. Uh, so you will notice your uh, <clears throat> list will become smoother. The more, more you get used to the pump and how to set up in advance and things like that. So it is extremely cost effective. It will make your anesthesia very cheap in the long run points well taken thank you so finally i would like to thank all three of you for Dr. your Tushar valuable is not seen in the screen yeah as he <laughs> tushar is left 
okay okay <laughs> um, yes message him okay okay so thank you so much for joining us today it's a pleasure and honor to have you all three here and also for your valuable inputs and for your valuable time with us thank you so much and wish to meet you all in person again for another workshop on triva pretty soon and uh, <laughs> advanced doors <laughs> <laughs> and uh, thank you i would like to thank aig hospitals for providing us the wonderful platform to perform this webinar today and uh, also our wonderful anesthesia department who have been working in the ot even until now and uh, giving us time to prepare for the webinar and be here and you know helping us uh, to do a webinar like this so heartful thanks to entire anesthesia IT. department IT and, and also mm. not but not the least i mean we can't thank enough our it department at aig hospitals who always makes our webinar experience such a wonderful experience they give us uh you know the entire it team for uh giving us such a fabulous experience and uh dr tripti and dr neha thank you so much for being uh, such yeah. an awesome presentation i mean it's not a joke that three experts said that you didn't leave a point you almost covered everything and they didn't have anything to say so i think we can always clap your back for this <laughs> <laughs> in fact looking and, at the, looking at the presentations and the background myself and dr kk had a chat is the questions going to be on the same level as the talk or what yeah. do do? and yeah. finally our heartful thanks to dr sunil pandya without him yeah. i don't think we would have initiated without his supervision i don't think this would a webinar would have been such an awesome but again experience. again it goes back to three of them <laughs> from whom i got the inspiration <laughs> just last month and uh, we have implemented them glad that we have implemented very soon <laughs> it's always a circle right yeah. so <laughs> thank you thank you thank you everyone thank you. for making this thank you. even thank success you thank, thank you thank you have a nice day from the bottom of our heart yeah we are signing off thank you thank you